Dialogue at the Wilson Center is a production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. And now here's your host, John Molusky. Hello and welcome to the Wilson Center in Washington, D.C. Each week, Dialogue explores the world of ideas and issues in international affairs, history, and culture. This week, a look at Washington's many monuments and memorials that attract tourists and visitors from around the world. Even the most beloved and iconic of these tributes to America's history have experienced their share of controversy. Our guest today will provide insight into the meaning and stories behind these great landmarks. Chuck Tampio's long and distinguished career as a civic educator included more than 20 years as vice president of programs for the Close-Up Foundation, one of the nation's largest civic education organizations that brings thousands of teachers and students from around the country to the nation's capital each year. He's developed and written a new presentation called Monuments and Memorials, Meaning and Mania. Chuck, welcome to Dialogue, and you used a lot of M's in that title. Well, glad to be here, Mr. Molesi. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about the origins of the project. When, when did you get, you've been involved in showing people around this town for many decades, uh, even now that you've moved out west, it's still an interest of yours. So has this been percolating for a while, or did something new spur this idea? Well, I, I got a job as a docent at the Tucson Museum of Art, and uh, they asked me to do a, an art talk, a presentation on art, and so I began to reflect on the artists that have most influenced my life, and you know, the, the familiar, you know, Rembrandt and Picasso and all of that, and then I began to think about the memorials and monuments of D.C. as public art, mm -hmm. kind of art where art and history intersect. Had you thought about them as works of art in the past? I had not, actually, and so I began to think of them uh, and look at them critically and analytically from a, an art perspective. And uh, so I developed a, a talk about that, and I've been giving it in Tucson uh, at the university and a number of other venues. And it's been, it's been a great deal of fun, and uh, I've been very pleased by the kind of response that uh, I've gotten. And taking it national at Inauguration Week here in Washington, D.C. Well, yeah, that's, it's, 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 a, it's a thrill, actually, to be here and to be presented, presenting it here, because I've actually given tours and written curriculum uh, on how to visit a monument and how to study the meaning of a monument, but uh, now I'm looking at it from a slightly different angle, and that's been uh, it's been a really a lot of f fun for me. What kind, what kind of feedback are you getting from audiences? Is this uh, a, a topic that people are very interested in? Well, you know, if you think about the fact that, uh, um, you know, what is the most iconic American work of art? You know, in in you know in Italy they might say it's the Last Supper, in Paris they would say it's the Eiffel Tower. Uh, and here we, ha we don't have a great national artist that has totally captured the imagination. So I began to think of, you know, that perhaps the most recognizable work of American art... Our Mona Lisa. Is, uh, our Mona Lisa is the Washington Monument. The Washington Monument. As a sculpture. Mm -hmm. You know, thinking of the Washington Monument as a sculpture. And when you look at it as a sculpture, it begins to resonate in, in completely different ways. So let's, let's uh, begin to talk through um, well, before we go to a specific monument, I want to ask you about this, the controversy question. Sure. I used it in the open. Uh, the ones that happened in my lifetime, of course, I can remember debates over World War II that went on right. for a, a long, long time. Uh, but we tend to, when we look back in time, assume things went, well, we're, we're much more a smooth transaction. Uh, are controversies part of every monument? Well, or conflicts is maybe a better word? Yeah. The... Um, the interesting thing is that when you look at the Washington Monument or the Lincoln Memorial or the Jefferson Memorial, they look inevitable. They look like they were always here. You can't even imagine Washington they without them. The city. Well, they, they, they define the city, exactly. But the fact is that they all took very rough roads to get there. Uh, every memorial uh, has started in, in controversy. And part of, the, part of the issue is that there are numerous commissions. Uh, uh, federal agencies, city agencies that all have input into uh, the construction, location, design of the monument. And so whenever, so, so really monuments are art that was created by a committee. Art by committee art with, by with committee. multiple bureaucracies ladled yeah, on top. That too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well let's take a look at the uh, Washington Monument as a starting point for, we'll, we'll preview for people who won't get to see the presentation, elements of it. And so you could tell us about the Washington Monument. Where do we start in decoding that monument? Well, well first of all, it's interesting to, to know that the to talk of a Washington Monument started right after the Revolutionary War, before uh, Washington became president, because there was such gratitude for his leadership in the Revolutionary War that there was, there was talk of a monument before he even became president. He died in 1799, and uh, there was a um, 
a strong interest in, in, a, in developing a monument uh, for him, but not until 1836 did actually Congress pass a resolution authorizing a monument. It took him another 12 years to uh, to start the to lay the cornerstone. And part of the issue was, you know, Washington as a public figure was recognized as a horseman. He was always recognized as a man on a horse, or or he would stand on his wagon while his horse would take him from Mount Vernon. To Washington, I'm picturing a horse there instead of this well, obelisk. Well, there, there was supposed to be. This was, it wasn't designed as an obelisk. It was designed as it was uh, when Robert Mills designed it. It was supposed to be a pedestal for a horse, huh. uh, you know, a, a sculpture of a horse. But what happened is that th that when Congress passed a resolution, interestingly, in 1836, they said that the Washington Monument has to be made out of all American materials. So, in order to get a, a, a horse sculpture. There wasn't a foundry in the United States until 1853, so we would have had to import a horse statue from Europe. So Made in America saved us from a horse. So Made there. in America, and and the, the monument design that Robert Mills created was actually quite different from what exists now. There was going to be a colonnade where you see the flags around. There was going to be a colonnade for the 36 states, and it was going to be capped as a as a pedestal for an image of some sort of Washington at the top. Uh -huh. So let's uh, now. I, I, I've had the. Uh, I haven't seen the presentation, but I have seen your PowerPoint slides. Sure. So I, I have a sense of where it goes on the outline. So I want to talk you, to you about this section where you talk about two presidents and two wars. Sure. And uh, so where do you want to start? Should we start with FDR? Or should we? Uh, well, let's start with Martin Luther King. Okay. The, the most recent one. And and be before, I mean, I'll tell you why I picked these four. Uh, there's a two two men, you know, FDR and Martin Luther King, and two wars: World War II and Vietnam. And the reason that I pick them is because these, these are monuments that have all been created in our generation, in mm -hmm. our lifetime, in the last 30 years. And so my, uh, my take on these monuments is that they are an expression of the values that we have, the vision that we have for our country. This is my generation, which is trying to communicate to the next generation, to my children and my grandchildren, about what these w what we see as intrinsic American values. So that's why I picked these four. And just to correct one of the things that you said at the opening when you talked about that some of the monuments st have started in controversy, all of them, all of them, all of them start in controversy and conflict. And all of the memorials really uh, also reflect the the successful resol resolution of a conflict. That's where I begin with the definition of a memorial. It reflects a successful definition. Uh, so the end of the of war of or the passage sure. of civil rights legislation. Sure, right. The, 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 the saving of the Union is, mm -hmm. is really what the Lincoln Memorial is all about. And the Martin Luther King, of course, was the success of the civil rights movement. And uh, the Martin Luther King Memorial started uh, in great controversy right out of the gate, actually, to use a pun, because the, um, the city was very concerned that the monument not be attacked by graffiti or an automobile or something that would reflect badly on the city. So they wanted to put a gate. They still were going to start to build it on a gate. And it's at 1964 uh, Independence Avenue, which is a great address for a memorial of that kind. Perfect. And, but they wanted to put a gate, uh, start with a gate. And of course, uh, the people who were behind the design of the memorial didn't think it was going to be appropriate to put Martin Luther King in a gated, in a gated community. community. Right. Right. There's something very perverse <laughs> right. about that. Uh -huh. yeah. So, okay, so MLK, and, or I mean, uh, yes, MLK. And then is there a relationship then between the Vietnam Memorial story, the war that happened at the time of this man's life, and that memorial? Or? Yes, they're actually one of the... There oh, are, you know, be, let me, let me yeah, interrupt sure. myself to say, because sure. I've been using interchangeably monument and memorial. Is there right. a difference? Uh, th th there's a difference without a distinction. Actually, uh -huh. a monument uh, is uh, related to, can be related to a, a, a life. Memorials tend to be related to a death. Okay. However, the terms are used interchangeably. The, the definition. Then back to our vary. regularly scheduled question. <laughs> sure. Yes. No, actually, the, uh, you know, the, and the wall behind the statue of Martin Luther King contains a number of inscriptions of his most famous quotes. And one of them is, you know, I oppose the war in Vietnam because I love America. Mm -hmm. And so there, there's definitely a relationship there. Uh, the, the unfortunate thing is that on all of these uh, inscriptions behind the, uh, the statue itself, there never is the use of the word nonviolence. 
and you know, if you think of one thing that Martin Luther King added to the civil rights movement, it was nonviolence. The other thing about it that's unfortunate, I think, is the fact that if you were going to distill Martin Luther King's message to a single sentence, it would be an end of discrimination to African Americans. I mean, that is what he his campaign yes. was about. Most of the inscriptions are much more highfalutin and philosophical, but you don't get that message when you uh, actually look at the uh, inscriptions on mm -hmm. the walls. Now, the Vietnam Memorial, uh, it, it's uh, really a monument to the dead more than uh, uh, those who served in the war. Well, you know, at that's least the, what you see, the names, it's right, very vivid. Right, right. That's, that's one of the criticisms that was leveled at the monument from the very beginning. Uh, however, you know, I think that Jan Scruggs, the, 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 the guy who really was the spark plug behind mm -hmm. the development of the memorial, felt that these were, these were the people who gave the supreme sacrifice. And so they represent all of the people who served, because all of, all of the, 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 over a quarter of a million Americans served in the war in Vietnam, and uh, the dead were the ones that were the ones that gave the supreme sacrifice. So he, his view was that it stood for all of us. And that certainly is the way that veterans have seen it, that it, re, it, you know, because when you go to the wall, your image is reflected there, so you're part of the monument. Very poignant, and one of the great things about all these memorials and monuments is they become gathering places for people who feel the, the greatest connection. But in very different ways, actually. You know, the, the, the interesting thing is to compare Vietnam and World War II. If you go to the Vietnam Memorial, most people visit that memorial in silence. It's a somber experience. And, yeah, and, the, and, and, and the, you people walk past each other, and are lost in their thoughts, and you see very, very little dialogue and conversation. The opposite is true at the World War II Memorial, because it's a, it's a sort of a stage. You know, it, it was designed kind of as a stage. And especially if you see some older Americans there that serve, they wind up talking to each other. So it's kind of a forum for a conversation about the meaning of the war, where the Vietnam Memorial is the reverse. It's a, it's a time for individual kind of solitude and reflection. There is also a sense, I've seen the reunions that you describe at the World War II Memorial. Sure. There's also a sense of uh, celebration that, you know, we're, we're here, this is our memorial, we did this. Well, it's a, it's a celebratory memorial, which is part of its problem, I think, because, uh, you know, after the Vietnam Memorial, I mean, every memorial after Vietnam is a response to the Vietnam Memorial. It was such a significant, event and memorial design in history. So everyone can be seen as a, somehow a commentary or reflection or an argument against the Vietnam uh, Memorial. And so the, the, the World War II Memorial celebrates the victory. And uh, the notion of celebrating war is one that I, th I thought we had gotten long past. Do, do you think that might have something to do with the passage of time, how long after World War II the memorial was built versus Vietnam, which was closer to the event? Well, actually, John, you know, there, there are factions in, in Washington from the Fine Arts Commission and, uh, and the National Mall Planning Commission and, and, and also some private groups that have their own take on how these things should be done. And there's one strong faction that says that, the, that memorials need to be classic, they need to be made out of white marble, they need to have columns. And then there's another faction that says that that day is long past and we need to think about a new way of looking at it and, and designing memorials. And after Vietnam, a lot of the memorials were designed in a minimalist kind of way, you know, to try to, to, try to abstract thought to a single powerful image. Mm -hmm. What's it, give us an example of one of those. That's the very ab abstract approach. Uh, well, uh, the, the Vietnam Memorial certainly is the most, but you know, the Martin Luther King Memorial in, it in has Birmingham. elements that certainly are that. Uh, yeah, sure. So a single water, fa a single mm -hmm. fountain, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, th those are examples of how uh, th this kind of classic notion has been uh, changed. Now, the FDR memorial is more a park than a single monument in the way we've thought of them in the past. Yes, it is. Yeah, it's four ro what they call rooms, each standing for a different one of his uh, four administrations. And it's how did that come about? How was, I mean, it, it's very different than the others. What was the process that led to this four well, rooms I, approach? Yeah, I think that the, the uh, architect uh, who designed it, uh, Lawrence Halperin, thought that FDR's achievements were so many and so multiple and so diverse, from the end of the Depression to the great, uh, the New Deal to any World War II, that there, there needed to be, you know, different, uh, representations of each one of those achievements. And so that they organized that by designing four rooms, each for a different 
uh, era of his administration. And it's kind of a Madame Tussauds of the, uh, of the FDR period by, by really it's fine artists. Time travel. You get to walk through the events of that. Of that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but that's in a more. Now, what I remember, was there, wasn't there controversy over whether he should be seen in the wheelchair or standing or. or that, yeah, that was one of the major controversies. And what they. It, it's interesting to think about how the com commissions make these decisions. And what they did for the FDR memorial, because that was the controversy from the beginning about whether he should show, be shown in a wheelchair, is they decided to poll his family, his, all of his living family members, and they asked his family. How would you think he should be portrayed? The family voted against the wheelchair, and so the monument was was concluded and built without the without the wheelchair. But the American disability community really petitioned uh, President Clinton to uh, change the uh, design of the memorial. So not only did did Clinton decide to put a wheelchair, it's the first thing that mm -hmm. you see when you enter the memorial. What you just, uh, the story you just told speaks to the complexity of the multiple messages that people want to layer into these various monuments. There, there's a lot at stake. Well, there is, and you know, because it's, it's about who interprets history and how, how history and, should and be interpreted. And what our messages to the world about how we see ourselves. Right, and you know, if, so if you look at the FDR memorial, it has a very, very strong uh, narrative structure. Uh, and every time I go there, I learn something new about FDR. There's so much content to the memorial. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the Vietnam Memorial, I think, tells us everything we need to know about war, you know, by looking at that memorial. And that war is catastrophe, war is death, war is annihilation, all the rest is footnotes. Uh, the World War II Memorial is just a celebration. And there's no narrative structure, and you don't learn any, uh, in my view, and this is a very personal view, and I don't mean to offend any veterans, because I know the, the contribution that they have made to our society and our country. But uh, when you visit the memorial, you really don't learn why we fought there and what, what was the reason or for it. It's just a celebration of victory. Yeah, it's pretty. It is pretty. But not necessarily a history lesson. And yeah, uh, exactly. The, let's uh, talk about two of the other uh, granddaddies, uh, uh, the Lincoln Memorial and the Jefferson Memorial. Uh, do you have a favorite from among those two? Well, I love those memorials. I think all Americans do. Uh, but you know, I think that people don't realize that, that the, the Lincoln Memorial especially started with a great controversy because uh, it was developed around the turn of the century by, by a large group of Republicans who wanted a major Republican figure on the mall. And Lincoln was the obvious choice. Uh, the progressives at the time, though, wanted there to be a, a, a highway, the Lincoln Highway between Washington and Gettysburg, kind of an American Appian way, mm -hmm. you know, devoted to Lincoln. And so Henry Ford was very strong behind this idea. Oh, surprise. The, uh, uh, because of the t this was the age of automobility. And so, uh, so the uh, uh, members of Congress and the Senate went back and forth about whether it should be a highway or a, uh, a monument. And uh, the monument factions won out, won out and in 1922, the uh, monument was dedicated on the mall. No offense to Mr. Ford, but I couldn't imagine the mall without the, the Lincoln <laughs> the, the, No, memorial. none of us can. The, the Jefferson Memorial, I've always enjoyed, you mentioned the quotes that are at the MLK Memorial, which are, even though they may not accomplish the, the point you made, they are fun to read, uh, they're inspirational and aspirational. They are. And Similarly, Jefferson, talk about the Jefferson Memorial. Yeah, the Jefferson Memorial uh, is interesting because after the Republicans built the Lincoln Memorial, when FDR got into uh, 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 the presidency, the first thing he wanted to do was build a monument to a Democrat. So, uh, so he wanted to anchor the other end of the mall with a, a Democrat, and he actually shortcut the process you know, where, where the Lincoln Memorial was debated in Congress for uh, uh, decades. The uh, Jefferson shortcut, I mean, uh, FDR shortcut that all decided uh, that there shouldn't be a competition for a winning design. He hired his friend uh, to design the, uh, the monument, and they built it on the tidal basin. And Eleanor actually picked the site, which was a, a whites-only uh, segregated beach uh, on the tidal basin at that time. So, uh, and the, they laid the cornerstone of the Jefferson Memorial on December 7th, 1941, uh, ironically. Uh, enough, and so FDR was criticized strongly for continuing to build that 
uh, during the war when resources and manpower was scarce. And so... Uh, uh, and now his memorial sit right, sits right next to it. Yeah, I think, uh, I think he would have been very pleased very, by that. Uh, I'm wondering if you came into this project with a favorite memorial and, and, or monument, and then with all the things you've learned, uh, you're, you maybe changed your mind. Well, actually, uh, my favorite memorial is one of the, the, probably one of the most overlooked uh, memorials. It's the memorial to George Mason, uh, which is right behind uh, the FDR memorial. And I, I really like it for its modesty. It's a, a, a life-size image of him sitting on a park bench uh, with a book and his hat and his cane, and uh, it shows his humanity and probably one of the most important thinkers of the uh, constitutional uh, period. And, uh, and I think its modesty speaks volumes uh, uh, compared to uh, uh, the Martin Luther King Memorial, where it is, you know, designed in a kind of a Soviet realist style, this large, imposing statue. It sort of looks like the kind of statue that is pulled down after the revolution. Is there a? Uh, I'm sort of looking for tourist tips here, Chuck. Is right. there? Is there a memorial that, or a monument that is overlooked by the millions of people who visit this city every year? Well, uh, we have we have 1,600. Uh, 1,600. <laughs> yeah, I did not know that. <laughs> we do in Wash 1,600 statues in Washington. 160 actually formal uh, memorials, and I mean we have memorials to Sonny Bono. There's a Sonny Bono <laughs> My favorite, by park the way. where you Glad, could thank you for bringing where, that. Where in his vault you could find the original uh, 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 lyrics for uh, the beat goes on. For some reason I'm tempted to end this segment by singing "I Got You, Baby," <laughs> but I don't know why. <laughs> Maybe that. But, uh, okay, well, continued success with this, Chuck. Really great to see you, and congratulations on this new project. And uh, our, our listeners and viewers don't get to do this, but I get to see the full presentation in front of a group of educators shortly after this taping. So I look forward to that as well. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me here, John. So do you think you know everything you need to know about the Cold War? Well, think again. We'll return in a moment with more dialogue at the Wilson Center right after this. The Wilson Center is America's living memorial to its 28th president, connecting the world of policymaking to practical options derived from the world's finest ideas, research, analysis, and honest nonpartisan conversation. Visit us on the web at wilsoncenter.org. And now we return to more dialogue at the Wilson Center. Welcome back. Laura Deal is a catalog specialist with the Wilson Center's History and Public Policy program. And more importantly for this discussion, she's one of the architects behind a new resource for those of you interested in learning more about the Cold War. Laura, welcome to Dialogue. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. It's great to be here. So what is the, the uh, International Cold War History Project's digital archive? What are we talking about here? Uh, well, we've always put documents online um, for nearly a decade now, um, but this uh, is sort of a relaunching of our website with uh, much, much improved features, uh, making it much more user-friendly and easy to explore and really dig into our documents, which are uh, historical documents primarily from the Cold War period and uh, trying to focus on non-U.S. documents. Uh, when the project started out initially, it was searching for um, documents from former communist countries, uh, but it's really expanded since then, uh, and we're just trying to gather together as much as we can and uh, sort of find links between all these different regions and areas uh, and even beyond the Cold War. And so you call it a relaunch, but really, as I understand it, it's, it's virtually a brand new presentation as far as the interactivity and the graphic look and all of those elements. Oh, that's very much true, yes. It's uh, completely, completely redesigned um, from a previous website in a lot of really excellent ways um, and really, really just vastly improving, and we hope that people like it. Now, and not for historians only, and if in a previous conversation with you we discussed that, and so I learned that you're, this isn't just for specialists. Uh, anyone can find value in this, is that correct? Exactly, um, and one of our main goals really with this redesign was to make it so that the non-specialist students, history buffs, people who haven't even picked up history textbook since secondary school can go dig in and find really interesting exciting stuff because we we have um, some amazing fascinating fun documents on all kinds of topics and, and regions and areas but it's just about making it so that it's easy to get into there and dig in and we, we hope that we've done that now with uh, some really great browsing tools that let you just sort of narrow a search and even if you don't know what you're looking for I bet you can find something you'd like. Now you, you mentioned that initially it was the the original version uh, until the new and improved version was mostly US documents then is th that's by necessity correct in that a lot of the new documents that you're uncovering come from society 
companies that were previously closed and were not in any mood to release their documents. Yes, yes, that's exactly right. Um, and really, when the Cold War project started uh, in the early 90s, just after the fall of the Soviet Union, the goal was to get access to these documents that previously were completely inaccessible and to get Western historians using Eastern sources, uh, digging into Russian archives, Eastern European archives. But since then, it has expanded greatly, um, and we try to encourage archival openness as much as we can. Uh, most lately, that's involved some um, closer relationships with uh, several Chinese universities, um, as well as the foreign ministry archives in China um, through uh, some uh, careful negotiation, we convinced them to release to us uh, a number of sets of documents which are both available in their reading archives to anyone who can come in, mostly Chinese citizens, uh, but also foreign researchers, but also to allow us to publish many translations of these documents and uh, make them available to a much wider audience. Does the story change? Does history change when you start getting these previously unreleased documents? Oh, it definitely does. I mean, in, in a major way about it is just sort of getting access to these narratives that, that were not available at all. Um, and one of our main research areas is in North Korea, uh, partially because obviously North Korea is extremely closed. And one of the only ways to research the history is to dig into these archives of their former communist allies, uh, where you can get into conversations with Kim Il-sung and uh, other high top leaders, as well as conversations between, say, the Soviet Union and China talking about um, North Korea deciding to invade South Korea despite their uh, strong objection. And openness wasn't a trademark of theirs. So no. well, Laura, where can people find it? What is the web? address? Uh, our address is digitalarchive.org. That's all one word, digitalarchive.org, which will direct you to our front page, and you can dig in from there. Well, thanks very much. Uh, I, I know I, I enjoy your excitement about this. It's good to see somebody who's really into the subject matter. Well, it's been two years of hard work, and we're just so excited that <laughs> well, other that's people... It. It's a relief that yes. it's over. Now. It's a relief, but we're just so excited <laughs> that other people can now get access to these fantastic documents. Great. Thanks for joining us. Well, Thank that's you. all for this edition of Dialogue at the Wilson Center. Until next week, I'm John Molesky. Thanks for joining us. We'd like to hear from you. Please send your questions or comments to dialogue at wilsoncenter.org. You can also follow us on Facebook. Search Dialogue Television and Radio. Our host's Twitter feed is twitter.com backslash John Molesky. Dialogue is a co-production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars and MHZ Networks. Dialogue is available via broadcast, cable, satellite, and telco on MHZ Worldview throughout the United States. To see how to watch where you live, visit www.mhznetworks.org.